Welcome to this next clinical condition featuring Sean Eno of Extreme Footworks. On today's clinical condition, we're talking metatarsalgia, which can just be a real general pain in the foot, um, pun intended, but it's a really good episode, gets into some deep ideas of what could be causing that pain, some different options to try and treat it. As always, we highly recommend checking out the video portion of this as he does have a model and is very active during the presentation. So please check it out and learn something about metatarsalgia. I'm Sean Eno. I am a certified pedorthist and owner president of Extreme Footworks Incorporated, a custom foot orthotic and biomechanics lab in Idaho Springs, Colorado. I'm a guest today of Dr. Kyle Bowen. Thank you. Today we are discussing metatarsalgia. Metatarsalgia is a pain to the person coming in as a patient that occurs in the ball of the foot underneath any of the lesser med heads. Um, but typically, it's usually two, three, or four, okay? The fifth med head isn't typically involved in that type of uh, swelling or pain, and the first will have a different diagnosis if it's the first med head. Um, for those of you, which is my first, your large toe is your first, your less, lesser, smallest outer toe is your fifth, and it counts across, okay? For the sake of today's conversation, we're going to talk about primarily toes two, three, and four. Um, Metatarsalgia, by definition, is swelling of the metatarsal heads. Um, the metatarsal heads are joints that have a synovial and fluid encased in what's called a plantar plate around them. I like to think of it as a pillowcase around a fluid containing a joint, and a joint is two bones coming together to function. The ball of the foot is to propel us forward, but also to give us stability left to right by firing either the first toe or the left toe. And that, that, that movement of inversion, eversion is what allows us to stay upright on a variable terrain. So if you walk near barefoot in your backyard and it's not completely flat, then you'll know what I mean because your foot is having to do different things, okay? Be, depending on where you are and location to your yard. Uh, it's the same thing as what hiking does to you or bouldering versus just walking through the mall. So speaking of, that change in position of the foot is healthy for it. Walking through the mall is like slapping your hand with a frying pan. And so we do find that people who work on man-made surfaces a lot and take a, a great many steps present with our previous discussion on plantar fasciitis as well as metatarsalgia because these are the two locations that are getting beat up the most, okay? And ironically, people who have feet that will go flat to the ground complain less of both pathologies and they have other issues, okay? And that's because their foot can accommodate that. It's that foot type that doesn't have a lot of change in position against the ground that really gets beat up by man-made surfaces. And so it's a swelling of the joint mortise basically, okay? And what happens in the long run, if that swelling is allowed to occur, like say you have uh, as a patient uh, person have a, a low pain response, like you don't feel things until somebody hits you with a baseball bat, then you might have been aggravating this for a long time, right? And not know it. And what can happen then is what's called a plantar plate rupture, where the pillowcase splits like ripping cotton and the synovial fluid runs out and the med head plantar flexes, or it's called a dropped med head. So when that happens, there's a sign that either there was a, you know, you kicked your foot when you were a kid and you broke something, or you did have a plantar plate rupture that was never diagnosed and the joint subluxated through the torn pillowcase, i.e. the plantar plate. So I get into plantar plate because plantar plate is the extension of metatarsalgia. It's like the worst case scenario, okay? Metatarsalgia is just, it's getting beat up. Now there's a couple of things that happen here. Most of us have curves and twists in our legs that cause us to have to adjust our feet. And we use that with the extensor group, which then it dislocates the joint slightly when the extensors become dominant. Just like my hand here in free space, one would argue that my plantar flexors are dominant, right? I go flat and they pull back. Well, on the foot, it's the opposite because we're all in extension down below. And that extension pulls the fat pad that exists over the metatarsals and metacarpals into the sulcus line and displaces it. That displacement then exposes the metatarsal heads 
to the skin on the bottom of the foot. And therefore the skin starts to thicken callus. And we see these weird calluses that form on people's feet while their fat pad is lollygagging up in front where it has no purpose. Okay. So you can take that back. That will and can be demonstrated at some later time. It takes a little bit of time to show how that works, but it's very effective. Nine out of 10 patients in my office love it, buy tape from us and tape their feet in conjunction with whatever else we're doing for them, okay? And a lot of times that's an orthotic. So what happens with the tape is the tape pulls the fat bag, that pad back into place and creates one's own natural padding in that location. That's the number one thing that should happen to give the body back its own chance to protect itself. And then developing stronger plantar flexors, like we've discussed with other pathologies, to offset those dominant extensors. That's what you guys, students and docs out there, want your patients to stretch those extensors through toe stretches, uh, extensor stretches, and, and you want them to fire their plantar flexors through foot doming exercises, short foot exercises, possibly wearing flip flops and varying up their footwear during the day to recognize the need to keep those toes strong on the down motion towards the floor. That will all structurally pull everything back into a better place and help metatarsalgia. But what we do also have to do is discuss what's going on between the foot and the ground, right? So none of us can walk across the mall floor for very long barefoot before we'd all be looking at each other going, let's go down the store to the shoe store, okay? Because this floor is beating us up. Now we could maybe soft loamy forest the beach moves underfoot. There are places that's possible and you should enjoy that as much as you can. It's good for you. But in the other instance, you need to find good, supportive, and also cushioned footwear. And you may need to have an orthotic that holds and controls your arches because aberrant motion of the rear foot, midfoot, i.e. excessive supination or pronation of the foot contribute to forefoot pathology, i.e. the metatarsalgia may be related to some poor biomechanics of the foot in the midfoot and rear foot. So you have to look at foot function. And then it also allows for us to fill, there's this little hollow in here and you can, if everyone looks at their hand right now, whether they're listening to the, the podcast here, they see a little hollow in your hand, that's where a met pad would live, okay? So let me see if I have one here. Here's a similar thing to a met pad. This is a met bar pad, it's a little wider. And basically it would mount hollow behind the metatarsal heads and that would be part of an orthotic and so an orthotic would manage three arches this arch this arch and this arch you got your lateral longitudinal medial longitudinal the classic arch and your tarsal arch the metatarsal arch and so studies have shown that a foot that over pronates has a tendency to create excessive down pressures on metatarsal heads two through four so that's why an orthotic with a met pad also helps the second and third and fourth met heads. There's one other pathology that contributes to excessive metatarsalgia. When we have a Morton's toe, which is a shorter first metatarsal shaft than what is ideal, and ideal is defined as it's as long as the second, right? So when we come across the French curve of the forefoot, you want the first and second to be the same length or close to it. And if it is off a little bit, that's not a true Morton's, uh, Morton's toe, but if it's off a lot, that's a true Morton's toe. And what that does is it creates an underutilization of the large uh, MPJ first ray joint. That joint is supposed to do 2.5 uh, times more work than the other four lesser ones at toe off. And if it's not down and on the ground because it's short and stubby, then two and three end up getting pounded for two reasons. One, they're doing more of the work to control pronation. And two, they're the last two med heads to leave the ground a toe off. So you can literally screen your patients for Morton's toe. And if they have Morton's toe, they're going to get metatarsalgia at some point, depending on what they wear and what they do. You know, if they're a monkey in the forest, they're not going to get it. If they live in a nice environment and, and have an idea about it. But the other thing we see secondarily to metatarsalgia is, is any underutilization or breakdown of the first ray like bunions, right? So someone gets a bunion first, and then later they get metatarsalgia because now the first isn't doing its job. Now they're walking off of two, three, and four. So those are the causes and the, and the, the solves are getting the fat pad back in place, supporting the foot for any aberrant motions it goes through in stance phase, and providing some displacement pressure in the form of a metatarsal pad or metatarsal bar mounted on an orthotic to offload uh, pressures under the med heads themselves through toe off. And lastly, 
Just like the other pathology we discussed a moment ago, plantar fasciitis, if the posterior compartment, the calf, soleus, and Achilles are too tight, then the foot goes into early heel rise, placing an undue burden on those joints in question for metatarsalgia. So stretching your calves can give you metatarsalgia relief almost immediately. So we get our patients in for an eval, we give them tape, jobs, show them how to do it themselves, sell them tape, give them posterior compartment stretches and cast them for orthotics if they need them. And that is determined by a little more assessment of the rest of their step function during gait. Awesome. So when you're using tape, I assume just like a, a standard rock tape or can you see anything tape? that's sticky enough because the foot has a lot of sweat glands and that it is, um, can apply enough tension to, to pull that back. It should be almost uncomfortable the first time you do it to a patient because that stuff has not only squirted out like toothpaste in the wrong place, but it's taken up residence there and it doesn't necessarily want to move back unless it's really held on to. Sure. So, you definitely so what's the duration of using that tape then uh, one or two showers one or two okay. showers and then, uh, for what period of time like, are they well, not so if we can get the joint mortise uninflamed and we can get them loosened up in plant or dorsif ankle dorsiflexion and if they need support they're supported and you have redistribution of plantar foot pressures through an orthotic then i'm thinking about a month Okay. four to six weeks okay and then the shoe has to be considered too if they are not fit well into a shoe if they have an asymmetric foot relative to the average that shoes are made from which is the last then they will often size down a little bit to get a better fit through the midfoot if they've had a foot that pronates like mad over time and they've shortened their size to make that fit better then they've also done the same thing which is put the flex point the ball of the foot in the in a place where the shoe doesn't want to bend and the shoe ends up being a part of the the process so you will have patients that said i never had this problem and i bought these shoes now i have this problem that's you know there's a bigger picture and you can't just pick off one piece of it usually you kind of have to look at the big picture and find out which pieces of that puzzle you need to address yeah for sure how about for the the mat pad then is that like an indefinite type of fix or is that yeah you use those you use the met pad and the setup that they use a met padded device in for most, much of their say, depending on where the deforming environment for them is, if they're a postal worker, then it's got to be in their work shoe every day, right? If they're an evening jogger on the streets five miles every night. Now, when you're just kicking it up and down and you're not necessarily a bunch of forward motion on man-made surfaces, then you probably don't have to have your orthotics and your met pad on you should be doing some of your alternate footwear stuff and some of your barefoot exercises and things to keep your plantar flexors strong perfect cool sounds Excellent. great well, thanks thank a lot, you